Welcome to Lab 4 in Biology 139. We're looking at blood pressure and we're looking at things that can affect it. So one of the things that you need to learn is the Bainbridge reflex, but it isn't in your uh, textbook, oddly enough. So we're going to have to actually research that a little bit and find out what's going on with that. And you need to be able to calculate the mean arterial pressure. This graph hopefully will give you a mental picture of what's going on so you'll understand how to calculate the mean arterial pressure or MAP as they usually abbreviate it. So here you are. This is the most relaxed that you have for your aortic pressure and this would be your diastolic. So relaxed is diastolic and that in this particular case is 80 millimeters of mercury and then when the heart beats and the ventricle ejects the blood then we go all the way up to 120 for our millimeters of mercury so we jump from 80 to 120 which is 40 and if this was going to come up and come right back down then we could just divide by two and we would get the mean but as you see the pressure has to come out because it's going it's dissipating throughout the body so you're spreading that blood away from the heart all the way down to your toes and your fingertips so it's not an even up and then straight down so what they do to figure out the mean pressure is they take a third of this. So there was 40 and a third of that would be roughly about 13 millimeters of mercury. So you take the 80 and you add the 13 and you come out with 93. So the map for this particular person would be 93. So the steps we took, we found the lowest pressure, the diastolic. We took the highest pressure, which was the systolic, and subtracted them and came up with 40. We divided it by a third, and we came out with 13. And we added that back to the 80. Here's a problem for you to work out right there. Apical pulse and radial pulse. Are, your heart is pointed at the bottom and most people think that the word apex means the top but it means pointed. So the apex of the heart, the apical region of the heart, is actually the bottom of it that kind of points downward and more towards the center of the body. So you're going to use a stethoscope and you're going to count how many heartbeats there are by listening to the bottom of the heart. So here's the heart. There's the apex right there. And if you look right here, you're counting down the intercostal spaces and you're going to find the place to put your stethoscope right there to do the apical pulse using a stethoscope. The radial pulse is found coming down from the thumb and use two or three fingers. Some people believe in two, some people believe in three, but never the thumb. The thumb has its own pulse, so if you're trying to feel a pulse with something that has a pulse, you're going to have a trouble reading it. The reason that's called the radial artery is because it runs along the radius or the radial bone. And you can always find that by finding the thumb, and coming up from the thumb. Before we talk about the aortic reflexes and the atrial reflexes, uh, we need to have a quick review to make sure that we know what we're talking about. So you have four chambers in the heart. 
you have the right atrium and the left atrium. So they're rather small. And then you have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And then, of course, there's your apex down here. The blood comes from the rest of the body up, fighting gravity, using valves, using muscles, and even some um, smooth muscle contractions that are going to bring the blood back up. So you can have venous return from the inferior vena cava into the right atrium and the superior vena cava into the right atrium. And at the same time, you're getting blood back from the lungs. And it's been oxygenated. And it's going to return through the pulmonary veins. And it's going to fill up the left atrium. And then it'll passively drop down into the left ventricle. And the same thing's happening over here. You fill up, and then it passively drops down in here. And then when it's time to contract, this valve keeps the blood from going back up this way and this one keeps it from going up this way and so the only way to exit in the case of the right side is it's going to go to the pulmonary trunk and through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs and on the left side it's going to come out and go through here can't back up back into the atria unless you've got a defect of some sort. And it's going to come out here and it's going to go out the aorta. All right, so four chambers, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. The left exits by way of the aorta and the right exits by way of uh, the uh, pulmonary trunk and going to the lungs. So now you can talk about the apical pulse and you can define the radial pulse. And we looked at the venous return in the left and the right side. So now we're ready to talk about these reflexes. This is an atrial stretch. All right, so where was the atria? Those are those two little chambers at the top of the heart, sitting right above the ventricles. So atria, don't get it confused with the arterial, atrial and arterial, two different things all together. If you go to Wikipedia, they usually have very good information, but you always have to be careful because anybody can put anything in Wikipedia. So I went and looked at the Wikipedia, and this is good stuff. So the Bainbridge reflex is also called the atrial reflex because it happens when you overfill the atria. So you've got too much blood being returned, and it's going to stretch the atria. There are stretch receptors in both sides of the atria, and this will increase this increase blood volume will cause an increase in heart rate. So you've got too much pressure, you're stretching the atria, and so you're going to increase the heart rate trying to get the blood out to relieve that pressure. So that's the Bainbridge reflex. So part of today's lab is to figure out what can you do to cause the atria to overfill which would then cause the heart rate to speed up. In today's lab, we're going to look at the blood pressure and the heart rate from doing different things. So you'll be standing up, and then you sit down. So you check to see what happens to the blood pressure when you do this. And then they want to know what the sympathetic nervous system is doing. So you need to remember, you need to go back and review what sympathetic and parasympathetic are. And sympathetic, to me, is fairly easy because whenever I see the sympathetic, I think of emotions. 
And when I think of emotions, I think about fight or flight. I think about adrenaline rushes. And we need to we need to start practicing when we say the word adrenaline, also say the word epinephrine, because everyone else in the world calls adrenaline epinephrine. And I always tell the students, if you're over there on the crash court looking for a syringe to pull up some adrenaline to you know put in someone's heart, the patient will die while you're busy looking for that bottle of adrenaline. What you're going to be looking for is a bottle of epinephrine to put in their heart. All right, so what happens to the heart rate when you are standing and then you suddenly sit down? And there's a hint because it's in the section on Bainbridge atrial stretch. You may have heard of bariatrics, which is the study of uh, problems that very obese people have. It's fat. So if, when you look at this barrel reflex, you're like, what? Well, it has to do with pressure. So they name bariatrics bariatrics because the people have so much pressure on their body from all of the extra weight that they're carrying around, the extra blood that they're having to pump, the extra fat that they have. So this means uh, pressure. And we talk about barometric pressure. So you're familiar with this word. But anyway, so arterial. So we're going to look at the arteries. We're going to look at the stretch in the arteries and specifically two places. The blood leaving the heart goes to the aorta ascending the aortic arch and then the descending and right here in the arch you have stretch receptors and then if you come on up the branchings off from the aorta and you have the left and right internal carotids and you also have pressures detectors right there or stretch detectors right there so barrel receptors arterial barrel receptors now, this is going to send information through the vagus nerve on upwards, and the carotids are going to send the information through the ninth cranial nerve. If you remember, the ninth cranial nerve is a glossopharyngeal nerve. So now that you know where the arterial barrel receptors are that we're interested in this particular lab here is a flow sheet that will help you understand what happens if you have a decrease in blood pressure so here's two words that you need to know for sure the def uh, definition of when you talk about afferent it is taking the message away afferent in this case, it's going to go up to the brain. Then we're going to come back and have an effect. So you can have the efferent pathway. So afferent's going up to get guidance, and efferent is coming down and saying, okay, this is how we're going to deal with this particular situation. So use your book and look and see what the efferent thing is happening when your blood pressure drops. What happens to your peripheral nervous system? What happens to your sympathetic nervous system? And here are some of the effectors that are acted on. So the heart itself, obviously, if you want to change blood pressure, the heart's a good place to do it. But you also can dilate blood vessels or constrict blood vessels. So this is another way that you can regulate how much blood is coming into the heart and leaving the heart. And the adrenals, which is something we're going to study when we come to the endocrine system. But this is something, it's a, like a little hat-looking uh, area of tissue that sits on top of the kidneys. So I always say it looks like somebody was chewing their gum and just parked it on top of the kidneys 
and it's going to be making your epinephrine and your norepi, or as we say in America, adrenaline. It's going to be making your adrenaline for you. And then again, when we get into the uh, urinary tract and talk about the kidneys, and then when we again get into the endocrine system and talk about hormones, we're going to talk about renin and how it converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin. So the kidneys get in on the act, the adrenals get in, the blood vessels, as well as the heart. So hopefully I've guided you so that you can find the answers to what is an arterial baroreflex, where would you go to look for these baroreceptors, and then what nerves are going to take the signals from the baroreceptor up to the brainstem, the afferent signals. So here are the same questions that we were looking at before, but this time we're looking if when blood pressure increases, what effect does this have on the sympathetic, on the vasomotor neurons? So does it increase or decrease? The parasympathetic, does it increase or decrease? Does the heart rate increase or decrease if the blood pressure increases? Does the cardiac output increase or decrease when the blood pressure increases? And Here's another one. What happens to venous return when you change from lying down to standing up quickly? Now, old people know this. You don't do that. That's just not something that you do. Because if you try jumping up out of your chair, or jumping out of your bed, probably you're going to end up falling. So the blood drains out. Gravity works. <laughs> so you don't have enough blood going into the heart. So how would that affect, affect your blood pressure if you don't have blood going into your heart because you stood up so quickly? And then the blood drains away from the brain too, which is why sometimes you actually pass out. So answer these same questions in this particular event. If you're laying down and you stand up quickly, what happens to blood pressure? What happens to the sympathetic and the vasomotor neurons? What happens to the parasympathetic? What is the effect on the heart rate, the cardiac output, and the blood pressure? If you take the systolic number that you get when you're taking a blood pressure and you subtract the bottom number, the most relaxed, this is going to be your pulse pressure. So when they're asking what the pulse pressure is, in the case of the example we were using, 120 over 80, then the pulse pressure, you subtract these two and it's 40. So that's a nice healthy one. If you have a difference when you take the high number and the low number and you subtract it and you've got more than 40 millimeters of mercury that's considered to be unhealthy in my own personal case when you do my blood pressure my pulse or excuse me the pulse pressure is 70 so it's way more than the 40 and so you go down here and you say, well, what could cause you to have an unhealthy or larger than 40 millimeters of mercury pulse pressure? And it has to do with uh, aortic sclerosis so, or um, aortic regurgitation. So in my case, I'm missing a flap. So when the blood leaves my heart through the aorta, the flaps should prevent it from returning and dropping back down into the ventricles, the atria in the ventricles. And in my case, it goes right back down into the ventricles because I'm missing one of the three flaps. So here's your vocabulary words, systolic pressure, diastolic pressure, subtract them to get your pulse pressure. The mean arterial pressure is not divided by two but it is divided by three. So you take the pulse pressure, divide by three, and add it back to the diastolic pressure, 
and that gives you your MAP or your mean arterial pressure. You need to be able to pronounce and spell sphygmomanometer. So if you've ever said the word Ralph, it has an F sound on the end, Ralph, but it's spelled R-A-L-P-H. So here you have a P-H that sounds like an F. And trying to put an S and an F together, you end up with sf. So this is sphygmomanometer. Sphygmomanometer. Most people don't listen to Karatkov sounds anymore because we now have digital sphygmomanometers. A sphygmomanometer is that blood pressure cuff that you put on. So the old-timey way of doing it is to put the cuff on and then put the end of your stethoscope kind of a little bit up under it so you're above the antecubital region. You're above the inside of the elbow, up underneath the cuff itself, and you're listening for the brachial artery before it branches off and one goes off to the radial side and one goes off to the ulnar side. So... Uh, this is a Russian guy's name, Karakov. And when you have the blood pressure cuff inflated, you literally shut off blood flow. So while you're listening to the brachial artery, you don't hear anything. But as you gradually release the pressure, as soon as the pressure inside the artery is the same as the pressure in the cuff, you're suddenly going to hear the blood. And if you've got one of those little gauges, you'll actually see the gauge bouncing. So it was, the needle was going down the gauge, and then all of a sudden it starts going bump, bump, bump. And you can actually see the heartbeat, and you can hear it with your stethoscope that you've stuck under the sphygmomanometer. Here's a picture I found that kind of helps explain what I was talking about. So here you have the brachial artery branching off to the radial, towards the thumb, the ulnar, towards the little finger. But we're going to be above the elbow on the inner, the inside or the crook of your arm. And you're going to pump up the sphygmomanometer. You're going to pump up the blood pressure cuff over 160 and it's going to completely shut off blood flow and then as you release the air from there when you get around 120 millimeters of mercury this is when this pressure inside the blood vessel should equal the pressure of the cuff and you start hearing the Karatkov sounds okay and see, here's where you have your stethoscope, right there, just above the crook of the elbow on the inside. And you're going to listen to it and listen to it and listen to it until you stop hearing the pulse. You stop hearing the bump, bump, bump of the pulse. And that is your diastolic reading or your lower reading. And so if this one was 120, where you started hearing the sounds, the sound should die away at about 80 if you have the normal pulse pressure. So we've talked about the blood pressure cuff, the sphygmomanometer. We've talked about the sounds of carotid cough, and we've talked about the Bainbridge reflex, which is, remember, the atria, not the arteries. It's the atria not the arteries. The arteries is another thing. And contractility is the contraction of the heart muscle without any um, abnormal thing like overstretching it. It's just what, what contractility you have. Things that can affect it if you work out and you build up more uh, heart mass or if you've had a heart attack and some of your heart muscles died and you replaced it with scar tissue. Scar tissue doesn't contract very well. Now this is one of my favorite 
experiments that we do in the laboratory because it's, it's kind of interesting and you don't really think that it would make a difference, but it, it really does. So one of the things we're going to do is just learn how to take a blood pressure. So you want your systolic, which is your highest number, your diastolic, which is your lowest number. You're going to calculate your pulse, your mean arterial pressure. So that's just standard. But then we're going to determine the apical and the radial pulse. And you're sitting there going, well, it would be the same. If I listen to the heart, it's going to go beat, beat, beat. And if I listen or feel with my fingertips out at the radial artery, every time the heart beats, I'll feel the surge of blood over there in the radial artery. And then the heart beats again, and I feel the surge of blood over in the radial artery. And for a healthy person, that's exactly the way it happens. But some people who have something going wrong with their heart are going to have what we call a pulse deficit. So the apical beats may be 100, but the person who's measuring the radial pulse, putting their fingers on the radial pulse and counting the heartbeats, they may only get 90 beats. So even though the heart beat 100 times, that pulse that reached out to the radial artery didn't make it in 10 of the uh, heartbeats. So you only register about 90 of them. So that's called a pulse deficit. And one of your tasks is to look up and see what would cause a pulse deficit. What would cause the blood not to make it all the way out to the radial artery? For those of you who cannot come into lab, here is a recording that shows you all of the next uh, parts of the lab, including the data. So you don't have to actually be in the lab and run the computers and run the equipment to get the data. So we're going to give it to you uh, via this. So you can pause this and jot this down and then type it in and watch this video. Before we start the lab experiment, I want you to look at this picture. I thought this was funny because I was really happy that they had such a nice picture here. This is the one where I showed you the brachial artery and it branches off to the radial and the ulnar and how you compress it and you get the diastolic and you get the systolic, excuse me, systolic and the diastolic. So I was so happy with all of this. And then I looked at the picture and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so bad. Okay, so here's the thumb. Here's the radial artery right there. And this is where you're going to be listening for the uh, Korotkov sounds. But look how they put the blood pressure cuff on. The, this tube right here is supposed to be laying, coming down from the brachial artery and towards the radial artery. So this tube, there's no way that they're going to get a blood pressure because the sensor is designed to where this comes down here towards the thumb. So this is not how you put a blood pressure cuff on. It's very sensitive to this tube being over this artery here right there so i want to i don't know how many students have been taught incorrectly so here are your directions on how to put the blood pressure cuff the sphygmomanometer on and it tells you how to do it and then it tells you where to put the stethoscope and it tells you between the antecubital fossa, so antecubital is the fold of your, in the inside of your elbow, and the lower edge of the cuff, so that you can 
uh, listen to the brachial artery. Now, where they had it in that picture that I showed you before was actually too low because once you get into the antecubital region, you're about to branch out into the ulnar and the um, radial arteries. So you're going to put the stethoscope in the area where they've already branched off and you're not going to hear it. Or you're going to be confused because you're going to hear both of them at the same time. So you want to be up more than they were in that picture. So that was that picture was excellent to show you what not to do. Ask the person before you take their blood pressure if they normally have normal blood pressure. If so, you only need to pump out up to about 160. In my case, since I have weird blood pressure, you have to pump me up, my blood pressure cuff, up to 200 and then allow it to come down because my upper reading is usually around 160. And that's with three different blood pressure medicines. And this says the same thing that I said. The first time you hear a sound, that is your systolic pressure. So pay attention to what number is on the dial when you first hear the sound. And then when the sounds completely disappear and you don't hear any blood flow, you don't hear any pump, 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 then that is your diastolic. So that's your lowest. So here's more practice on doing the systolic, diastolic, figuring out the pulse pressure, calculating the map for yourself or for one of your team members or lab partners. All right, and then look at what's normal. Now, this changes over time. So I've been teaching for at least four decades, and it used to be 125 over 75, and then they made it 135 over 85 because what's normal, how do you do that when you've got anywhere from 40 to 50% of the people in the United States are obese and they don't have a normal. So what is normal? If you are over 130, then they say you're, you have hypertension and you need to be... Uh, looking at taking some sort of medication, figuring out why do you have high blood pressure. And the diastolic, if it's up close to 90, then there's something wrong if it's over 80. So that's not, that's not healthy. Here's the part of your lab manual where you're going to fill out the apical pulse and the radial pulse. Now you're going to have to have two people working on the same patient or the same lab partner. So one of them is going to be listening to the apical pulse, and one of them is going to be measuring the radial pulse. And it helps to have a fourth person who's actually the timekeeper and says, okay, start. And then this person is listening and counting. This one is feeling and counting. And then when they say stop, you write down the values that you have, and they should be the same. But if they're not, you need to figure out what, what would happen in the heart that would cause a radial pulse not to equal the apical pulse? All right, and then why can't the radial pulse be greater than the apical pulse? When you, if you understand that question, then you, you understand the pulse deficit. So we have a computer program called the BioPack, and it's loaded onto our laptops, and then we have a little unit, a little box that does the biopack program. You hook the person, whoever the volunteer is, up uh, to the right arm and the left leg and they use the black lead to ground the person. So it's important to get the right arm and the left leg. Have the person stand up take their blood pressure, and run the program and get an ECG reading. Put the pulse rate and the blood pressure on the data sheet. So that is for when someone is standing. And then have the person lay down. 
and have them do it quickly. So you've already got the blood pressure cuff on. You're ready to pump it up. Have the person lay down. Make sure the sphygmomanometer is in place already. And turn the machine on again and let it take another ECG reading. And you're taking the blood pressure and you're going to put it into a table. I went into that program that uh, one of the other teachers made and I stole his data page. So when he did the experiment, when he was standing quietly, his heart rate was 85 and when he laid down, his heart rate went up to 105 beats per minute. Now you need to figure out why. Why when you're standing up can your, your heart do what it needs to do and provide nutrients and oxygen throughout the body just beating 85 times a minute. And then you lay down and suddenly you are having to beat 105 beats per minute. So what happened? You need to, to research that. You need to think about that. You need to understand what's going on. Um, I would look at things like arterial pressure and atrial pressure to see if he can figure out what's going on. All right, after he had laid down for five minutes, now his heart rate not only went back to the 85 that it was originally, but it's even dropped further down and now it's a 69. So your beats per minute when you're laying down and have been laying down for a while, drops off because it's easier to circulate the blood if you're laying down. You're not fighting gravity like you are when you're standing up. All right, so you've been laying there for five minutes and suddenly you stand up and look what happens. Your blood pressure shoots up. So to go from 70 beats per minute to 105 beats per minute, and the only thing you did was stand up. That's it. You're not exercising. You're not doing anything. You just stood up. What happened there? It's not the same thing that happened here. So there's a different set of receptors causing this one and causing this one. So think about it. And then after you've been standing for a while and you come back to what your resting rate is, around 85, 84, then go out and do something like jumping jacks or run up and down the hall for three minutes. Do some sort of activity that will get your heart rate up. So this is your exercise rate right here. So here is data that you can use since you're, if you're watching this video, you may not have gotten to come to lab and actually do the experiment itself. And you can listen to the video and he will explain what's going on as he does it. So here's the blank uh, thing not filled out right here. And it tells you, it gives you a hint. You need to look at arterial barrel reflex definition and Bainbridge reflex definition and figure out what's going on here, what's going on here, and what's going on here. And is it sympathetic? Is it parasympathetic? What's happening? Underneath the little chart, it actually gives you a hint. It says that standing and then immediately reclining would have something to do with the Bainbridge reflex. And after you've been laying for five minutes and you suddenly stand up, that would be the arterial barrel reflex. So that's it for this week. Make sure that you go page by page, filling out the blanks, seeing if you can understand it. And you should be able to go right into your textbook and it should have this picture right here, and this should be out of your textbook, and it should explain exactly what's happening, and it should talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic, the vagus nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, the number nine, which is 
uh, due to the stretch receptors or baroreceptors in the carotids. 